We are starting with the second session. The second session that is going to be chaired by Blanca Landa from CSIC, Spain. So before starting second, the second session, I want to tell all the speakers that uh, in the first row there will be a person with the uh, sound labels with different colors. And they will announce you when you have three minutes, two minutes, and one minute left. Okay? Uh, zero. Not one minute. Zero. <laughs> okay? So pay attention to the colors and fit on time. Okay? So our next speaker is Leonardo de la Fuente from uh, Auburn University in the USA. And he will talk on calcium has multiple roles during the interaction between Silela fastidiosa and host plant. Leonardo. Okay. Hopefully everybody can get in in time and we can get going. Thank you for the organizer for EPSA to invite me to give this talk. And uh, let's see some people coming through. Okay, I'm going to talk today about the role of calcium in the interaction between Sardella and uh, different host plants. And maybe we can wait a couple of minutes before. <laughs> okay, we've been studying in my, in my lab, we studied interactions of the bacteria with uh, different uh, plant hosts. And we are very interested in the formation of biofilm and movement uh, of the virulence of this uh, bacteria. And what the, the picture that you see here is uh, silent vessels of uh, uh, grapes. And this picture was taken from by my former advisor, Harry Hoke. And you see um, formation of uh, biofilms inside the, uh, the vessels that is uh, related to the uh, disease. So in order to study this system, we have the, developed uh, years ago, uh, during my postdoc at Cornell, a model system that we call the artificial silent vessels uh, that allow us to image the process of formation of biofilm. Okay, so basically we are going into details. Uh, we handmade these ones with photolithography using silicon wafers. Uh, they are channels of the, representing the size of a sudden vessel, and they are clear, so we can image in our uh, microscope. And uh, the first thing that was discovered using the system was that the bacteria actually moves against the flow. Uh, in previous reports, it was classified as a non-motile uh, bacteria, uh, but thanks to this, uh, um, uh, system, we saw the bacteria moves against the flow in something called twitching motility that is known in other bacteria. Uh, but you see that the media is going from left to right. What you see here is a time lapse movie, so it's not real time. You don't see the movement if you just see it in the microscope all day. Uh, and this is a comparison of non motile bacteria. So this twitching movement against the flow, we saw in the chambers. You can also see it in the agar plate. When you grow a colony, you see a fringe around it that is indica indicative of this uh, movement. Okay. It, um, all, another thing that we have seen is the formation of the process of formation of biofilm. And what I want you to see here is uh, these are two parallel channels that we inoculated with the same inoculum of bacteria. The only thing that we changed was the media. This is a synthetic medium, the PD2. And this is a silent sap from grape that we collected in the field. So basically what I want to call your attention is the process of aggregation uh, here. Uh, you see separated aggregate from each other. And in the grape sap, it's like a full uh, biofilm uh, plugging, plugging the, the whole uh, channel. So that was an indication that there's something in the grape sap that makes the bacteria uh, act different than the uh, more artificial media that we use in the laboratory. We look at the composition of these uh, two uh, media. We saw, of course, some elements, as you guys know, the silent vessels of the uh, highway where the elements are uh, moved uh, by the plant. And some elements were uh, di very differently concentrated between uh, one, uh, the grape sap, and, and the PD2 media. So we uh, did a series of experiments and we hypothesized that these mineral elements may have an influence on the way the bacteria uh, cause disease and maybe uh, controlling the virulence. Uh, I'm not going to go into details, but the one that we focused was on biofilm. We saw that adding biofilm to the media uh, increased the production of uh, uh, calcium to the media, increased the production of biofilm and also increases the twitching movement. 
Uh, and then when we went to the other side, to the plants, we uh, have, first we did this with tobacco plants as a model system, and we saw that uh, the, when we infected tobacco with uh, different uh, isolates of uh, Salera fastidiosa, uh, the seven ones that they were the most virulent ones caused this increase in calcium in the leaves of the tobacco plants. And also we saw the same thing when we did it in blueberry as a host. Uh, the, the two more aggressive strains have uh, produced more calcium accumulation in the leaves of these plants. And then we went to the field uh, over three years. Uh, we sampled pecans, uh, uh, grape and uh, blueberries. And uh, we saw also that this increase in calcium accumulation in calcium in the leaves uh, is also present in the field under natural uh, infection. Uh, so that's why we have been focusing on calcium, because we see calcium enhances the virus strains of this cellella, but also the plants infected <laughs> with cellella increase the calcium in the leaves and in the sap. So we're working under the hypothesis that the infection with cellella, what it's doing is causing a remodeling of the calcium inside the plant, and the bacteria has evolved to use this uh, remodeling of calcium to augment the virulence in a similar fashion as an autoimmune disease. Uh, the response of the plant is causing the, the virulence to increase. This is the, the working hypothesis that we have, and this is the model that we are basing our research lately. Uh, what you see here is a plant growing under normal growth. The yellow uh, balls here are, uh, represent calcium. Uh, this is one that is infected. So imagine that you have biofilm and the bacteria growing in the sun and vessels in this one. So when the bacteria takes up the calcium, uh, the plant sorry takes up the calcium, uh, goes, and if it's a normal plant, they, they get rich the leaves. Now if they have infection, what well, we have seen there's more calcium um, accumulation. More calcium, we see there's more biofilm, uh, more biofilm, more symptomatic uh, leaves. So we're trying to understand now what is the molecular basis of this uh, process. So what I'm going to focus now is like after we, we uh, found this phenomenon of this calcium from the plant and from the bacteria, we're trying to see the basis of that. I show here some of my students and postdocs that have been involved in this uh, research. And uh, I just wanted to uh, start by saying that calcium as a regulator of uh, bacterial phenotype can act basically in three major ways. One is uh, through electro electrostatic interactions. So calcium can serve as a, a ionic glue, if you want, uh, from the silent vessels in the bacteria. This, uh, this happens, but we, uh, we did some experiments showing that in the case of addition for the surface, the bacteria needs to be actively producing proteins. Yeah? So then uh, it, we, we didn't discard the, this uh, option, but it's, um, we think it's a minimal uh, player in the interactions of Silella and the plant. Uh, other way that they can act is by protein structure uh, regulation. See, some proteins have calcium binding motifs, and when they attach to calcium, they change the function and then they make it more or less uh, active. And the other one is a transcription regulation. Here, calcium is known in other bacteria, uh, and also mainly in eukaryotics, uh, that can uh, uh, influence the production of uh, messenger RNA. So I'm going to focus now on uh, what we have looked into, the effect of calcium in the virulence trays in both sides from the transcription regulation and from a structural regulation. And then I'm going to talk just briefly about what we're doing with the plant host, that we are much less uh, advanced, uh, sadly, than with the bacterial side of the problem. So with the transcription regulation, uh, this work was done by Jennifer Parker and Hong Yu Chen uh, in my lab. Uh, when we grow the bacteria, uh, we grew them in, in flask, and, and this is a close-up of this area of the elementary flask growth. Uh, this is uh, different days, eh? one, two, three, or four days. Uh, you see the pictures in the normal media that we use in the lab, PD2. You see the biofilm growing and somehow breaking apart in the later day. Uh, with the PD2, when we had calcium, this concentration of calcium was chosen because it's the average concentration of calcium we found in grapes when we uh, took uh, samples from the field. And uh, we see that in calcium, the, this biofilm doesn't really break. It's more uh, active, yeah? uh, more, uh, it starts being uh, bigger uh, as, as time uh, goes by. So we collected uh, from these three days uh, just a sample from the biofilm, uh, from the two media, and we did RNA-seq uh, to do a look at the whole transcriptome and see what uh, genes are being regulated by calcium in the biofilm. And long story short, uh, we saw that the, biofil uh, the biofilm genes or biofilm machinery uh, in the PD2 media, the, you see an increase of the production of the genes uh, 48 hours and then they crash, while in, um, 
calcium presence, uh, higher calcium presence, you see a continual increase of the expression of these genes. So what we, one of the conclusions from that uh, paper manuscript was published last year, was that if you look at the process of biofilm formation, uh, we say that at three days, uh, PD2 is in this uh, stage, yeah, it's breaking, uh, but uh, in calcium is still in the mature biofilm. So we feel like calcium is uh, an element that is uh, making um, this bacteria uh, for biofilm for longer time. So this was done in batch culture, that is the easier or better way that we have to use every day our bacteria, but we were curious what happened when we do this under flow conditions. As you know, Silella is constantly under flow, even in the insect or in the plant, so it's not a bacteria that lives in an area where it's like uh, sitting in their own um, uh, media. So uh, after a lot of tries and uh, 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 success and not success, we uh, did experiments in the microfluidic chambers. So if you hear the media, PD2, PD2 plus calcium, you see more aggregates, the movement is uh, faster, you can see it here. And we collected the cells from these channels, uh, and then we uh, conducted RNA-seq from the cell from the channel to see what happened under flow conditions uh, with this uh, regulation of calcium. Uh, this, we're still working on the analysis, so I don't have uh, definitive data, uh, but basically what we saw was that the uh, certain number of upregulators and upregulating genes, uh, this is the um, uh, expression then, when we compare these regulated genes that we saw in flask uh, compared to the, uh, the genes that we saw in the, in the chambers, uh, we found that only 19 genes were common between the two of them. And not only that, only four of those 19 have the same tendency. They were upregulated or downregulated. So the overlap between the flask and the chambers is, is minimal, uh, because as you know, it's totally different uh, concentration of uh, different conditions of growth. Uh, so, but what we found interesting was that this putative genomic island uh, that is present in the pathogenic bacteria but not in the EV92 strain, that is an AV2 strain, uh, 21 of the uh, 30 genes are not present in this one, and that pathogenicity island is was upregulated in both cases, in the chambers and in the microfluidic chamber. So now I have some students that I don't have results anymore further, but uh, we are trying to knock out some of the genes and see what the, if we can understand the function of this. And when we look at the global uh, RNA-seq of both conditions here, yeah, with the microfluidics and the flask, this is like the, uh, the distribution of the um, gene ontology of these uh, uh, genes regulated. Uh, doesn't tell you much, just that the motility and regulatory function genes, they are more in percentage-wise in our microfluidic chambers. But uh, as you can see, the problem and the challenge that we have is that more than the 50% of the genes that they are regulated by calcium and of unknown uh, function and character as protein. So uh, it's a challenge to understand what it is, but we, we, we're trying uh, to work towards that. And in the case of the structural regulation, uh, what we have done is, uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, calcium also can affect uh, not only by transcriptional regulation, but also by uh, attaching to proteins and changing the, the three-dimensional structure. Uh, we went through the genomes of Silella and we categorized, uh, we, we classified 42 genes that have uh, these different uh, calcium binding motifs. So of course we have a lot of uh, targets and um, some of them were are regulated, some of them were not, which is not surprising uh, at the name of the mRNA because they, they don't need to be upregulated to be uh, um, modified by calcium. So, so far from this list, we have worked in two of these proteins, in PY1 and MOB, that I'm briefly gonna mention. Uh, PY1 is a protein that is at the tip of the uh, type 4 pillar. So, yeah, this is the structure of the type 4 pillar. Uh, it's at the tip here. And it has a calcium binding motif, and when we started working on this, uh, published that year in PNAS, that in Pseudomonas aeruginosa, this uh, protein was, uh, was able to bind calcium, to crystallize the protein. They showed that it binds calcium, and uh, it seems to be regulating the movement. So we look at the genome of Salella, and we found that Salella has three homologs of this uh, PLY1 protein. Only one of them uh, has the uh, calcium binding motif uh, that was described in Monsa aeruginosa. So we uh, knock out uh, two of these genes. These two are pretty similar, but, uh, one that has not the calcium binding motif and one that does have the calcium binding motif. And we characterized the mutants, and basically what we saw was that when we mutated the one that has a calcium binding motif, the, the twitching was not increased by calcium. 
while uh, when we take the other one, the, the bacteria still uh, respond to calcium. So uh, we conclude from this work that only one of these homologs is important for this uh, calcium uh, binding um, and uh, twitching response. And the other protein that, I, uh, that we've been working on is the outer membrane protein uh, MOB. This is the most abundant protein in the surface of the cellula and contains also a calcium binding motif, a EF hand uh, motif. And it's important for the cell integrity. So um, when we, because we saw that um, calcium was increasing the biofilm, this is a surface protein that matches to calcium, it was like an easy target for us to say, okay, probably MOB is the responsible for this increase in calcium uh, bio, uh, biofilm under calcium conditions. Uh, the answer was we were wrong. Uh, that was not the pr gay protein. What we found out when we mutated uh, MOB is that the, the, the mutant itself, we did this with two different uh, backgrounds, two strains, the type strain Temecula from grapevines, and this is a, a, a very um, uh, virulent one, WM11, that we isolated from Georgia. And we mutated in both of them. In both cases, the biofilm is, goes down, but they still respond to calcium. Yeah? So the, if you see the normal media, the addition of uh, calcium, or on the condition of sap, of grapevine, they all form our biofilm. So uh, we show that MOB is important for biofilm, but not in the response to, to calcium. And interestingly, when we started analyzing these mutants, we saw so in both cases, they lost the, the twitching. Yeah, You see the fringe here, and then you cannot see any fringe in the mutants. Uh, and then when we look, uh, we confirm this by electron microscopy, and they were losing the pili. Not only the type 4 pili, that is the one of the twitching motility, but also this uh, short one, type 1 or, or chaperin Asher uh, uh, pili, they were gone. So it seems to be that MOB is important for uh, also the production of these appendages. And when we put these two mutants with the respective wild types in, the, in tobacco, we saw a, a reduction of uh, virulence. So both MOB mutants were uh, reduced in the virulence in the tobacco system. So it seems to be that MOB is important also for uh, the virulence of this uh, bacteria. And uh, now I'm going to move uh, briefly from the plant host uh, response to this uh, uh, problem. And uh, we, uh, we started working on this uh, because one of the first times I, I mentioned this uh, topic in an IPS meeting many years ago, uh, one of the persons in the audience, uh, when, when we were just doing the characterization in vitro, uh, they told me, what do we tell the growers about your work? And I told them, don't tell them anything, because at this moment I have no, uh, nothing to tell the growers. So now we're trying to get something uh, that can be more of a practical um, uh, approach, if you would mind. So basically the idea was like, can we, uh, we hypothesize that there's more calcium uh, in these plants and we think it's a response of the, of the plant, but what if we uh, artificially put more calcium into the plant by watering, will that change the virulence of the, of the plant, of the bacteria? So basically we did experiments with tobacco, uh, but we, tobacco we have uninfected and infected and we uh, water just with water, one that we add three millimolar and what a millimolar of, of calcium chloride and we follow the, the disease uh, progress. And we did this also with the two uh, isolates that we're working on, the fastidiosa fastidiosa temecula. And uh, basically, uh, we see the progress of the disease when we add a millimolar is, uh, is much more uh, virulent, they see more symptoms. And this is the area under the disease progress curve. You see with three millimolar, we don't see a significant change, but with a millimolar, we do see a significant change. And the same happened with the other strain. And of course, uh, uh, well, because we have done all this transcription analysis, we went and took the genes that we saw upregulated by calcium in vitro. With those uh, primers, we tested the expression of the genes in plants that were uh, having more uh, calcium in the system. And we saw that, uh, interestingly, yeah, some of these genes were more uh, upregulated. Uh, they were expressing more, sorry, at higher calcium concentrations, uh, stuff related to biofilm, uh, movement, and the different signaling. Um, Genes. So it seems to be that the calcium is getting inside the vessels and it's like uh, making this bacteria act as we saw it act in vitro. Uh, of course, the, the question that I, I wanted to have the results uh, for this meeting, but unfortunately we cannot uh, speed up uh, the biology of this pathogen. We're doing now the same experiment with grape because of course we did that everything in, in a, a model system in tobacco. So we have a similar uh, uh, experimental design where we have a buffer control and Silena we have is infected and um, uh, watered the plants with zero, four, and eight millimolar of calcium. And this picture was taken 
last week uh, by my student Laura that she just started working in, in the lab. And basically, um, it's, it's hard to see now. Uh, she sent me an email yesterday that she doesn't see much more symptoms than last week, so we, we don't have numbers. But uh, the tendency is that in Emily Mola we see more symptoms than in uh, four and then without calcium. But unfortunately, I don't have the final results at this moment to, um, to show you. So uh, also when all this uh, work uh, is being done, um, the question was, okay, but uh, you know, growers don't really go and water with more calcium on purpose. So what is the application of this stuff? So I've been having the question of uh, how is this related to soil uh, calcium content? Is the soil calcium content have an influence on the severity of the disease? Uh, I don't have an answer now. I just have a, 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 some uh, basic uh, information. So. This is, of course, there's uh, no scientific uh, ex uh, data analysis, but we're planning to do this in collaboration with Juan Navas from uh, SESIC. So if you look at the distribution of the different orders of soil, this is in Europe, yeah, and then uh, the ones that have the higher uh, calcium concentrations are the, these three, yeah, alpha salts, aridic salts, and moly salts. So the green color and kind of like a yellowish, uh, orangey color. Uh, the colors here are all messed up, but um, you see that some islands of that more uh, calcium, <coughs> of course it's not like a correlation of having more calcium in the soil and having more disease, but uh, I'm just putting the idea that it may be an extra factor that it, uh, it, it may uh, have an effect on, the, on the, the symptomatology of the bacteria. And in uh, the US, uh, similar, the three soils that have more calcium are also in, the, in California. Uh, so I, we don't know if it's make a, a, an effect or not. So basically from my uh, um, conclusions, I want to say that uh, we found that calcium enhances the venous, venous strains of salella. The, from the uh, perspective of the twitching, we, we found the, the culprit. We found the protein that is known that is response uh, to calcium, but for the biofilm we still don't know which protein is the one that, or proteins that they have an effect on the calcium. And uh, the transcription regulation is pretty different between the batch and, uh, and flow cultures. And we see that the addition of calcium by water increases the, the virulence. And with that, I just want to say thank you again for the meeting, the people that work in my lab and the funding sources. And thank you very much. Thank you, Leo, for keeping on time. So. Our next speaker is Oseas Feitosa uh, Jr. from the University of Sao Paulo in Brazil. And he will talk about Silela fastidiosa diffusing signaling factor 2 are found in Silela fastidiosa outer membrane vesicles. Um, I would like to thank the, the EFSA and the ILADA Conference Committee for inviting me. <coughs> Um, so I would like to start uh, saying that XF, DSF are found in Xylella fastidiosa outer membrane vesicles. And so DSF or diffusible signal factors are this molecule, a diverse group of C12 to 18 carbon in cellulated fatty acids that are synthesized by a large number of gram-negative bacteria and are released to the extracellular environment. Um, it's been shown that Xylella fastidiosa produces a, a large group of these molecules, including some that are also saturated fatty acids with some antagonist um, effect. So basically, um, DSF works in, in this way. So once the number of the cells um, goes up, also uh, the DSF in the environment increases, and some of these molecules uh, will disperse through the outer membrane of the cells and interact with the DSF receptor, also known as, as uh, RPFC. And as we can see in the 985C or CVC strain, we have this DSF signaling with the biofilm formation. Um, on the other hand, uh, for the FB7, um, also isolated from the citrus strain, uh, we, have, we have sequenced this strain and it seems that there's a uh, truncated RPFC. Uh, with that, we have absence of the DSF signaling, and in fact, we have no biofilm formation, as we can see in this picture. 
um, <coughs> because DSF are so important for behavior or the LFSTGs, we start to question how XFDSF would be dispersed in the extracellular environment. And one of our hypotheses is that this, uh, those molecules could be carried by other membrane vesicles. So to address this hypothesis, we made a series of experiments, um, not only to, um, to see DSF, but also to uh, explain a lot of things about OMVs. And it basically took the three uh, different strains, the FP7, or also a natural mutant of RPFC, the 9A5C, or CVC strain in Temecula. So after cultivating these three strains in PWD medium for seven days, we took the culture supernatant, and we did a GC analysis, uh, also using a protocol by uh, UNESCO, Zaini collaborators, we did a nanoparticle track analysis. And then using a protocol by Nascimento and collaborators, we did a OMV purification, um, doing a scanning electron microscopy, metabolomics, and shotgun proteomics. So first, we wanted to show that after this protocol, the OMV was to be uh, with integrity. And so as we can see in this panel, in the upper part, we have the uh, isolated OMVs in the three strains. In the central of the panel, we have a bunch of uh, the OMVs and also the OMVs next to the different um, strain cells. Um, second, we did a um, nanotrack analysis because we wanted to count the number of the OMVs secreted by each of those strains uh, that used in, in these experiments. So that, as we can see, the FB7 strain um, produces or secretes up to 60% more of OMVs than the CVC or the macular strain. So one of our hypotheses is that um, this higher amount of OMVs can be linked to the deficiency in the DSF signaling in this strain. Uh, so the focus of this talk, um, we did like metabolome using the LCMS approach and with that, we could find uh, 84 compounds for the strain 9A5C, um, 98 compounds for the strain Temecula, and 93 compounds for the strain FB7. Then we used the software of prediction probe Metab, and, and using this software, it took the all ions, uh, ions that we found and, and searched them for, uh, against the database of CAG. And we could uh, identify 23% of the compounds in the 9A5C, 27% of the compounds in the Demacula strain, and 28% uh, of the compounds of FB7. And, and these compounds can be grouped in, in these um, compounds, carboxylic acid, carbohydrates, hopanoids, fatty acids, carboxyl groups, nucleotide analogs, amino acids, uh, phenolic compounds, and T-peptide groups. So we focus our analysis on the fatty acids uh, because we already had the standards against uh, these molecules. So uh, we took the uh, XFDSF1, CVCDSF, XFDSF2, and the C18. Both the CVCDSF and uh, C18 uh, has been shown to act ex actually as antagonists. Um, and using the standards, uh, we comparing with the uh, retention time, um, we show that uh, all the uh, these molecules, CVC, DSF, XF, DSF2, and C18, are present in the uh, OMVs of the three strains. But the XF, DSF1 could not be found in any of the OMVs of these strains. Uh, we highlight that the XF, DSF2 it's been shown by UNESCO and collaborators to generate a high response uh, in a DSF biosensor strain, a Zewala strain. Uh, we also searched, we investigated the whole uh, supernatant of the, the three strains, and using a GC approach, we couldn't find the XF DSF1 in this case, but any of the other DSF molecules. Um, so with that, uh, we got to propose a model uh, of the OMVs of Xylella um, fastidiosa with not only carrying um, a mechanism of uh, violence proteins, but also the XFDSF2. So uh, in this model, once that the OMVs, they got next to the uh, Xylella cells, the XFDSF2 dispersed 
uh, through the OMVs in uh, all, the mem all the membrane of the cell and reach and re interact with the uh, RPFC, causing the biofilm formation. Uh, we also did a, a proteome approach um, to look for all the protein content of the OMVs. So we know by previous work that some important virulence factors like Zeta-1, uh, the last A, and the uh, antitoxin linked to the biofilm formation were already found in the OMVs of the Zalela fastidiosa. But we expand using the shotgun proteomics for the first time with the Zalela, and we could identify around 200 proteins in these three strains. So as we can see, uh, around six, seven proteins are shared between uh, the strains FB7, 9A5C, and Demacular, and as expected, a uh, large number of proteins uh, shared between the two citrus strains, 9A5C and FB7, and a smaller between Temecula and 9A5C and Temecula and uh, FB7. Uh, we also can highlight that there's a large number of exclusive proteins like 33 <coughs> by 9A5C, 13 by FB7, and 27 by a strain Temecula. So for the, uh, most of the proteins that we found in this proteome, uh, we should say that a lot of them were already previously described by other uh, paperworks like um, the ones in orange, by men's in, 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 in gray, by Nascimento. Some of these uh, important proteins found in this proteome is the uh, lipase, esterase, LAS A and LAS B, the adesine ZD1 and ZD3, and the outer membrane uh, proteins uh, OMPA and OMPW. Um, also, several other interesting proteins uh, were found for the first time in the OMVs of Xylella in, in this work. So, uh, in, in, in some of them are the putative microsins, uh, XF1217 and XF1219, the l arscobate oxidase that can work uh, diminishing the ascorbic acid in the Xylella environment present in um, the F FB7 strain in Temecula, uh, the putative pectin lyase, which can act as a cell wall degrading enzyme, present in all of the OMVs of the three strains, and finally the carbon oil phosphate synthase light chain, that being described in the literature as a, a DSF rapid degradation protein, but it only present in the Temecula strain. So with that, um, we're new hypothesis, consideration, and conclusions. I first time reported XFDSF2 found in the Lela fastidiosa. OMVs. Uh, the XFDSF1, a smaller fatty acid molecule, diffuses apparently freely in the culture supernatant of Zylella fastidiosa, and the OMVs acts as an additional secretion mechanism for proteins in Zylella fastidiosa. Um, I'd like to thank my supervisor, Aline Maria da Silva, Dr. Paulo Pierre, other professors in, in the University of Sao Paulo, the group of professors Stephen Lindo and UC Berkeley, and a group of Professor Bayer and UC Davis, including Dr. Paulo Zaini and Dr. Rafael Nascimento, and the funding agency CNPQ and CAPS. Thanks. So, our next speaker is Matthew Van Hoff uh, from the University of California, Berkeley. Uh, he will talk about the distribution and adaptation of Silella fastidiosa in California and grapevines. Hi, everyone. So I'm going to be talking about, uh, yeah, uh, like they said, so distribution and adaptation of Xylella fastidiosa in uh, California and Grape Point. So you probably heard about this a lot from Sandy and Rodrigo over the years. We have a new addition to their lab. So I'll be uh, taking a genomic perspective on, on this. So in the literature you've seen in the past recent years an increased number of studies bringing a genomic component into the analysis of microbial organism. So it's sort of this improved resolution sort of brings a lot of new questions in uh, ecology. So I'm going to try to show you how we can apply this to Xylella. 
So first, let me, let me thank all the Malam members involved in this project, uh, so culturing and sampling. So Anne, Michael, uh, Sandy, of course, Rodrigo, and uh, the rest of the lab. Uh, so for example here, Rafa has been uh, proven himself to be very good at leading lab meetings. <laughs> so California uh, has a known history of uh, Xylella. So it was first detected in Anaheim at the end of the 19th century, and so it was characterized by uh, Pierce, as you know, and uh, it still has a significant impact in California, causing roughly uh, about a million uh, dollars a year. So I'm going to be then focusing on the subspecies Fastidiosa. So as you see here, it is a monophyletic group. And, and from the Californian data, which are represented here, it looks very clonal if you compare it to the branch lengths of his other sister subspecies that multiplex or poke out where the branches are, are, are way longer. So this is a data set uh, we're working on. At the moment, we've got 122 genome sequence uh, from, from this uh, location in California. We're trying to improve this by getting other isolates, so the culturing, they are, they're being cultured in the lab at the moment. So we have, uh, so five, from, five isolates from Santa Barbara, 25 from uh, Bakerfield, um, 23 from the Temacula area, 41 from Napa, and 28 from Sonoma. So Napa and Sonoma are very close to just same latitude, and they're only separated by this one mountain. Uh, so this is sort of the question we can ask, and how can uh, genetic epidemiology sort of uh, be combined with uh, disease management? Uh, so you can sort of ask, uh, how much diversity can we find in California? Uh, is there a particular pathogen responsible for uh, a specific grape wine variety, for example? Do we see any spatial pattern? Uh, any sign of adaptation at a scale like uh, California. And also we can, of, with more data, reconstruct the evolutionary history of, of fastidiosa, subspecies fastidiosa in California. So is it coming from uh, the rest of the US? Is it coming from uh, Latin America, as we might have heard before? Or has it always been here in California? So this is uh, the result we get. So. What's interesting is that we find that those four populations are genetically separated. So you see very well here the Bakerfield, the Temacula sample, the Napa and Sonoma. Even the Napa and Sonoma samples, which are very uh, close to each other, uh, are, are separated. So this is the same tree, um, but what you can see on, the, on this tree is that there is a bit of integration of the Temacula group into the Bakerfield group. And this is Santa Barbara isolate, and you see here a couple of uh, Temacula and Napa isolate. So th there is a bit of movement there. So how much uh, diversity is present? So at the moment, we find about 5,000 SNPs uh, in this whole data set. You can see that each cluster has got roughly about 2,000 uh, SNPs. So here is a, on the right side, you see all the shared SNP together. So you see that Bakerfield's got about a thousand SNP of their own, Temacula's got SNP of their own, same for Sonoma and Napa. Interestingly here, you see that a lot of SNPs here are shared by those three groups. So what it sort of means is that you see in, that there might be some adaptation forces uh, acting within each subgroup. So this is what I've been talking about. So if you compare to Italy, which we work currently working on as well, we found an average uh, number of 250 SNPs. Rodrigo said 150, but it's roughly about, about this. So if you consider the same evolutionary rate for the POCA introduction into Italy or the subspecies uh, Fastidiosa into the US, then you can sort of predict how long has it been in California. If you arrived in Italy in 2013, you might have you know, arrived in California to get that much diversity by the end of the 19th century, sort of when we sort of uh, discovered it. So if you want to know more about Italy, I encourage you to all go talk to Anne, who's got a poster on this, so she's very nice. Uh, <laughs> I would go talk to her. So another question you can ask is, is this, uh, is, do we see genetic clustering within the, each variety of, of grape wine? So we sequence in this data set nine variety uh, over here, and as you see, it looks very messy. It doesn't look like there's specific uh, clustering. 
But that's one of the questions you can think about. What we do, however, see is isolation by distance. We were talking about mental tests earlier. So we, here we've got a bit more genetic diversity to ask this question. So we do find uh, a significant mental test of 0.35. Uh, so what, what you saw in me is that there is some adaptation, but there is also a bit of gene flow. So if you look at the right FST statistics, which is, uh, which looks at the allele frequency between population. Uh, so it's on scale to zero to one, zero being intense gene flow and no population structure, to one being complete separated population. You find that there is some gene flow and some population structure. Generally speaking, a rule of thumb is that if it's above 0.2, you have significant st structure. So you see be between Bakerfield and Temacula, it's about 0 0.1, 116. Where it's more separate, there is more subdivision between Bakerfield and Napa and Sonoma strain. And within the Napa and Sonoma strain, you only have 1.13, meaning that they have some sort of interaction between the two. So, another thing you can start looking at is um, trying to model the ecological niche and find the realized niche uh, within California of, uh, of Xylella. So the idea with this is that if you model using, so this is based on presence only. So again, we will get more data of, on presence because uh, we see sampling a lot more at the moment. So using 19 walking layers, we're trying to reconstruct the, the realized niche. So this is predicted. And if you have your model predicts what you see on the ground, you can start thinking about what are the environmental variables that are sort of shaping this. So with Maxin, it sort of allows you to look at what contribution each variable you plug in is, is contributing. So at the moment you see precipitation, warmest quarter, precipitation, coldest, elevation, or minimum temperature. And it sort of makes sense because we, we sort of know that if there is a sort of a warmer winter, you will get more disease in the, in, the, in, the, in the summer and the spring. So this is a question we need to start thinking about. So to do this, when we take a a landscape genomic approach. So landscape genomics is sort of a newish field. Uh, it takes into account population genetics, uh, landscape ecology, and, and, uh, and, and statistics. And it's sort of aimed to quantify how much environmental variable are contributing to adaptation. So this is an example of taking into account annual mean temperature. So here you've got the 5,000 SNPs. And using a latent factor mix model, we and a bond per any uh, correction to account for metal testing. We found 145 SNPs in, which are associated with uh, annual mean temperature. So, so that's 17 genes and uh, 33 non synonymous mutations. So the gene involved in this are, are, are listed here. Is that the one with uh, a non function? So here is a result. Um, so they're preliminary results, because we will get more data and more diversity. But what, what this slide shows you is that. Whatever cutoff you use, we do find interesting SNPs associated with particular uh, variable. Another thing you can look at is uh, the core and accessory genome. So Rodrigo talked a little bit about this using all the subspecies. Here on main figure, you've, you have the phylogeny of the Californian strain with each color for which uh, county they're from. So you see that about half of the genome is shared. Uh, Singh Rodrigo said about a third for all of the subspecies. Uh, and what's interesting here is that you see that some clusters, so the green clusters, seem to share some gene here. This one seems to share some genes that are not present in other clusters. So the idea now is to try to identify within each of those subpopulations we identified what gene are contributing maybe to to this uh, differentiation. So again here you see this number of genome. So all of these genes are shared by all the genome and all these are shared by a few isolate only. Another thing uh, to consider, so it's been talked a lot about in, uh, it's been talked a lot about in uh, MLST and especially in Rodrigo's talk, is recombination. So here you've got uh, an alignment of the core genome. Uh, and you, so this is a software called FastGear, so I sort of looked into recombination for whole genome. And you see that there is some integration, some, some gene or some like, genes are from each different cluster. So for example here, 
and here, like here from Napa into Sonoma, from uh, Temacula into Napa. And the idea is to sort of start looking at those genes. So this is so, uh, an example of the gene we find. So oxidation reduction process, ABC transporter, or hydrolase activity. Uh, one of the key aspects, of course, when you start talking, talking about genetics is selection, because it's known to be like the main, uh, the main driver of adaptation. So this is an early result from a MK test, which uh, look at the rate of synonymous and non-synonymous mutation, and also compares it to an out group. So the group here, uh, we suggest selected and multiplex isolate. So what's interesting here is that we do find gene under selection, and what's interesting is that they are from different clusters. So that sort of ties up with, um, with the environmental approach, saying that there is adaptation at the very local level. So you see gene from Bakerfield, gene from Sonoma, gene from Napa, or gene from Temacula. Um, so this is sort of summary uh, slide of how gen genetic epidemiology can influence uh, disease management. So as we've seen, uh, we can uh, reconstruct the evolutionary history. So at the moment, I'm only talking about California, but if we do have isolate uh, from subspecies fastidiosa from Costa Rica or from other region, we'll be able to tell uh, uh, the whole story. So we can identify particle genotype and uh, add, like other route of infection, predict hopefully potential spillover. Obviously, we'll get a deeper understanding of, into the biology with this uh, increased resolution and we can identify sign of adaptation and what biotic and abiotic factors, uh, how they're contributing to the diversity of the area. Right, thank you. So our last speaker for uh, session two is Annalisa Jampertrusti. And she will talk about the insights into the genome of the Denono uh, strain of Silela fastidiosa. Thank you, Blanca, for introducing myself. So, in my presentation uh, consists of uh, three parts. In the first part, I will uh, show you the result of uh, wool genome phylogeny based on the single nucleotide polymorphism and the study of the palm genome of 27 public available wool genome sequence of Silella fastidiosa in 2016. These results are already published in the paper of phytopathology. In the second part, I will show you the assembly strategy in order to obtain the complete genome sequence of uh, the olive infecting strains, Dalella fastidiosa, that we named uh, now the Donno, and also this is already published. And uh, in the last part, I, I, want, uh, I will give you just an updating of uh, uh, the study of whole genome phylogeny and uh, the pan genome of the uh, 40 currently public available whole genome sequence of Salella fastidiosa, including the, uh, the Donno. So, about the whole genome phylogeny based on the single uh, nucleotide SNPs. We did this work uh, on uh, uh, 27 Silella fastidiosa genomes that uh, at that time in 2016 were available in the, gen in the NCBI genomes database and are showed in this table take from the paper. So uh, all the uh, whole genome sequence were analyzed using this kind of software, which is an alignment-free sequencing analysis tools that identify the pan-genome SNPs in a set of the genome sequence and estimates phylogenetic tree based upon these uh, SNPs. And these are the phylogenetic tree that we obtained. So, uh, as you can see, uh, first of all, it is, uh, um, or the, it's a, we demonstrate the uh, already uh, known taxonomy, taxonomy of Salella fastidiosa, so we can distinguish multiplex sandy, morus fastidiosa, and pauca. 
uh, both in a pa maximum parsimony tree and uh, in a maximum likelihood tree. But uh, I want to put your attention in, in the for the phylogenetic placement of uh, uh, Xarella fastidiosa codiro, which is uh, very close to the other tree, Costa Rican ST53, and together forms, uh, made a um, divergent clade from uh, the subspecies of Pauca. In order to characterize other uh, genomic elements uh, um, in Codiro and uh, Costa Rican isolate, we found uh, also a conjugative plasmid of uh, 35 chirocarbase, and uh, uh, we found that uh, there is a high uh, percentage of similarity of uh, plasmid uh, uh, arbored by uh, Codiro strain with uh, plasmid arbored by a uh, Costa Rican isolate, the uh, coffee 407. And also, moreover, these two plasmids arbor uh, an uh, additional uh, sequence that uh, co um, is coding for uh, a par D, par E, a system related, uh, system related to toxin anti -toxic systems. So we are talking about, uh, moreover, we are talking about a, a conjugative plasmid that already uh, are described in other uh, subspecies of uh, Xylella fisidiosa uh, as uh, uh, multiplex strains. So the other approach is a, a pangenome analysis of Xylella fastidiosa. We run this, pan, this analysis using uh, this kind of software, get homologs, that uh, uh, which uh, uh, compute the clusters of orthologous sequence among uh, the whole genome. And you can see here the number of clusters obtained by two different algorithms. In this number of clusters, you can uh, um, in see the different class category of uh, clusters, so cloud, shell, soft core, and core <coughs> genes. Here uh, is reported the heat map and the dendrogram obtained from the average nucleotide identity matrix based on the uh, coding sequencing composition of all the genome. And you can see clearly the difference, the uh, cluster of Pauca and uh, Temecula and the multiplex and Sandy uh, on, on, the, on the top. So, but uh, I want to put your attention in the clade, in the clade of Codiro and the Costa Rican SD53, which is also here uh, with very compact and uh, is distinct from the other Pauca. So, interrogating this pangenome matrix, we also are able to identify uh, genes unique to this uh, ST53 clade. In particular, we found an ATPase, a putative uh, histidine kinase-like ATPase of 2008 uh, base pair, which is present only in the Codiro and the other three Costa Rican isolate, but not in the other uh, Pauca isolate, where uh, we are able to see only a product uh, without the insert of ATPase gene. In order to verify this uh, in vitro, we, we run an in vitro detection of uh, this gene coding uh, this uh, putative ATPase, and uh, as uh, we expected, we found a band um, of um, 2,080 base pair in the Codiro, but not in the other isolate of different subspecies. Here there are some isolated of uh, uh, subspecies Pauca coming from Brazil, and you can see there is only the uh, band without the insert of ATPase. But and here you can see a lot of isolates coming from the Costa Rica uh, of subspecies Pauca and Fastidiosa, and uh, we confirmed the detection of ATPAs of uh, uh, this uh, uh, in this kind of ST53 isolate. Moreover, an ATPase was also detected in two ST21 uh, here and here. To, are two uh, ST21 isolated from, isolated from coffee plant from uh, Costa Rica. So, 
Concluding this first part, I can see that uh, the two uh, trees constructed using the SNPs approach and uh, the pan genome data distinguish the subspecies fastidiosa multiplex pauta sandy, we, we, and this is already known, but uh, uh, groups the Italian and the three Costa Rican STF of three isolates in a compact clade that diverges from the South America pauca isolates. Moreover, we found this gene encoding a putative histidine kinase like an ATPase, and only in the clade of the Italian and the three Costa Rican ST53 isolates. And uh, uh, obviously, the, it is necessary to further investigate the role of this kind of genes. And uh, um, in the end, let me say that the, this work describes represented for me a great opportunity to exchange experience, materials, and method among institutions of different countries involved in the two year project. So uh, I think this is an important point. So uh, move on the second part of the presentation. I will show you the strategy of, to obtain a complete genome of uh, uh, olive strain that we name now De Donno because De Donno is the name assigned to the olive tree, which is site in the initial outbreak of the disease. This is the two, two pictures of the, this uh, uh, olive tree. So you can see now the uh, olive is almost dead. So I want to underline this, that the high isolate Isolate, the, um, isolated from the Donno tree was the same used for assembling the first uh, draft version of uh, released in 2015. And now we uh, complete the same, uh, the genome of the same isolate with the other uh, strategy that I show here. So we um, we, from the, bact from the pure bacterial culture of uh, isolate of, from uh, the Donno, we, uh, sequencing, uh, we sequenced the uh, reads with uh, a Lumina platform, so we obtain an higher number of fast poo paired reads, and uh, also we using uh, another strategy of sequencing uh, with the ISAC uh, um, PacBio RS2 platform, and uh, we used an enabled approach in order to uh, um, better uh, to obtain a robust, a more robust uh, assembling. And uh, at the end of this strategy, we obtain a plasmid of the donor of uh, 35,000 base pairs and a chromosome, a circular chromosome of bacteria of the uh, Donno, which the dimensions are reported also. And uh, you can see here also the, uh, how much is uh, homogeneous the coverage of reads uh, mapped uh, to the uh, both, the BOF scaffold. And is, this is important to be sure that the, the um, complete genome is, uh, is a good assembly. So the genome was uh, annotated and released, it now is public uh, in the NCBI. Here are reported the number of uh, annotation and the kind also the annotation. But also we have annotated by another tool uh, which is named, named Rust, and you can see we obtain the same number of coding sequence for uh, our complete uh, genome. Among the coding sequencing annotated, I want to mention the, uh, this finding. So we found that uh, the three uh, great uh, coding sequencing for uh, hemagglutinin are all, all the three are um, frame shifted, so they have internal stop code and are incomplete and uh, so on. And uh, this, we, we know already the important function of this protein in the uh, aggregation, cell to cell, and the formation of a micro colony of uh, uh, bacteria. Maybe 
this uh, frame shift in hemagglutinin-like gene may impair their function, making the bacteria more motile and more uh, virulent, as already reported in the other in literature. So, concluding this second part, we can say that the complete genome of Salella fastidiosa uh, strain de donno was used as a reference for the typing by whole genome sequencing based on SNP of all 40 isolates that were sampled in the uh, outbreak uh, Puglia. And here I'll show you again the tree already discussed by uh, Rodrigo. And also here are reported the number of SNP identified relative to uh, each isolate, but uh, I will invite you to, I will invite you to follow the, following the poster session to uh, get uh, uh, more detail about it. So, moving on the third part, I can show you an updating of uh, this study, so of the wool genome uh, phylogeny and the pan genome. So, what we did is uh, uh, the uh, downloading of the uh, other 13 genomes that were uh, become available in 2016. We re-annotated all the 40 genomes with uh, RAST, in, in, uh, so in that way we are uh, a, more robust, a more robust comparison, and we applied uh, again the software for pan-genome analysis and for uh, K-kappa SNP for identifying the SNPs at whole genome level. So again, the two, three, the uh, and maximum likelihood and parsimony. So you can see again the compactness of uh, the uh, ST53 clade, including now also the complete genome uh, de donno. Also here we are updating this number of cluster gene, and uh, you can see there is an increased number of uh, this, the cluster gene of pound genome. Here are reported, obviously, the number of the four categories, and when you can see the decreased number uh, is expected of the core genome. And uh, in this heat map, representing the degree of similarity among Xylella uh, genomes, which is based on average amino acid identity between the, the, all the members of the genome, you can see, again, the, uh, it is more easy to identify the ST53 clade. It, it is uh, distinct from uh, the all subspecies pauca. So concluding this third part, so the result of the updating of whole genome phylogeny based on SNP and the pan genome analysis of Salella genomes confirmed the phylogenetic placement of the donor and the ST53 clade previously and already published, and also uh, I can see that this gene encoding a putative histidine ATPase, uh, which is identified only in the, this clade, so in the, in the Italian and the three Costa Rican isolate, uh, still remains unique to uh, this uh, clade. So I want to thank all these people <laughs> showed here, so also Blanca for the Rodrigo for the support, but uh, uh, obviously Maria Donato and Pasquale and the person of my institution, Professor Savino and Giuliana, and also obviously the people of uh, informatic uh, infrastructure necessary to conduct this analysis. So thank you for attention. Okay, so we just finished on time, so I invite all the speakers to uh, sit, and we have time for questions till uh, 1.15. <coughs> for question is open now. I have
a question for you. Uh, you found that um, the minimum uh, temperature in winter has an, uh, is an, uh, a factor that is related to the vari variability of the strains. Uh, so on the other hand, do you see any differences in the cold hardiness of your strain clusters? So do I see any difference in what? In the cold hardiness of uh, the strain clusters from the different regions. Um, yeah, yeah uh, as, I think it's early to, to say. At the moment, this, we, from this model you're referring to, so we're talking about the ecological niche model and how, uh, how we find some uh, association. That is, uh, only I, was talking on, I was only talking about the contribution to the model. In, in, in this, and then after you move, once you identify your ecological variables are important, you move on into the landscape genomic approach. So do we see anything there at the moment? So this is, I'm currently analyzing uh, this data. Uh, so yeah, the script is almost finished. So we will know more soon. Is that, that, is that what you ask? Um, okay. So sorry, I can't answer. <laughs> Pasquale. I'm then good. For Matthew Vano, have you any explanation uh, to um, explain the, the clear genetic separation of the uh, area, uh, vineyard area in California? Clear, clear cut. Uh, so yeah, it, it, is, it is quite clear, which is uh, surprising. But, so I think this is so far where we can, we don't really know how long it's been there, but we can uh, postulate that it's been there since the end of the 19th century and it probably moved its way up into California, and uh, we see from the data what is clear is that we do see sound of adaptation. So we're looking at the moment into all the genes and uh, try to get a comprehensive story of, of why this is true. Uh, but see, if you remember that slide with the core genome um, and the pan genome alignment, you do see gene differences um, between the clusters. So it might just be I'm postulating that the adaptation, so different selection forces uh, and uh, environmental, just being subjected to different environmental uh, processes. Thank you. Over there, on the, over there. Um, it's a follow-up question on the uh, how long Silala has been in California. So the current thinking is uh, maybe about a century. Uh, what is the evidence that it hasn't been there before? Because there is a continuity of, uh, of hosts probably from uh, Middle America to California. So why hasn't it come earlier? Again, uh, yeah, that, that's possible. Like I said, we don't have the complete story. I'm only talking about the 120 genome we sequenced which are present in those uh, grape wine we found. So it just based, uh, the diversity I showed was about 5,000 SNPs. So if you look back at the POCA diversity and the single introduction story in Italy, you find 200-ish SNPs. So you can sort of infer how long it's been in California. But maybe it's been there longer. We're sampling more. I think what's good also is to sample more uh, like wild grapes uh, so maybe you will find some unexpected amount of diversity showing that it's been there longer. But at the moment, uh, the only thing I can say is 122 genome. It's based on this data. Okay, over there. A question for uh, Leonardo. Um, Within the Netherlands, we are testing a lot of different host plants to, be, to see if they are really a host plant. And you told that uh, adding calcium uh, can increase, let's say, the virulence. So you would suggest to increase the calcium in the water for the plants to test for host specificity? As, as a, like a, for like a big screening of strains that you're talking about. We see, you know, we see more symptoms. Yes, um, I didn't thought about using it as a as a tool for diagnostic or checking. But uh, so far, again, we only have data for sure in tobacco, and now we're collecting data on grapes. Uh, so maybe for suggesting something like that, I will wait maybe a month, and then I'll tell you what happened with grape. If we see in grape the same tendency, we could be more sure that this is like a real thing, you know, that happened in different plants. But uh, we see more symptoms. 
Uh, Ralf Köpnik from France. My question also goes to Leonardo and is linked to the previous one. You spoke about more symptoms when you add calcium. What's about the bacterial load and vector transmissibility? Okay. Bacterial load is the same so far that we check. The problem is that the way we check, we just check the, the, like the petioles. So I don't know, we, we don't check you know, the whole system, just you know, random three or four leaps. So from those, we don't see a significant change in numbers. Um, and then for vector, we don't do anything. We don't work with insects, sorry, so I have to. Yeah. Martin, and then on the top, okay. I have a question for uh, Oseas. Um, in the other, uh, we are always talking about a blockage of the, um, of the vessels as a pathogenicity factor. But of course, the bacteria also have to spread within the plant to move from one xylene vessel to the other. So therefore, it also needs the cell wall degrading enzymes. And if I am not um, misunderstood, you indeed found some proteins, enzyme, uh, enzymes for cell wall degradation, like the pectin liases, uh, so they could also be quorum regulated. Yeah, so what we always, it's a, it's a short talk, but um, one of our main investigations was to found the polyelectronase, which is being described for some time as a D enzyme as a cell wall degrading enzyme, but we never found in the secretome, the proteome, uh, of the OMVs. But then we, we found these, and, and we think that might be a, a good candidate to, uh, to act as a cell wall degree enzymes, and it's being carried in this OMVs with the different strains. A question to Leonardo. Thank you for that intriguing presentation. If more calcium makes the symptoms worse, have you considered exposing infected plants to calcium chelators to see whether that actually ameliorates progression of infection? We tested that with the uh, in vitro. So we used chelators of like external and internal chelators of uh, calcium. I didn't show that, but we showed both. If you chelate the calcium outside or inside the cells, they make less biofilm and they move less. With plants, we have not tested because it's very problematic, you know, the plant also need chelators. So no, if, if we put the chelators, I'm afraid we cannot control how much we're gonna remove and then the plant will die. They are, you know, more expensive to use as a watering thing. Uh, so it's an interesting question here, but we have not tested chelators in planta. We just tested in vitro and in vitro, yes, if you put chelators, the effect is reverse of the calcium. We have a question here, uh, down. Thank you. Um, a question for Leonardo. Uh, I have seen your presentation just a few days about the copper effect. Um, do you think that other um, divalent ions may have a similar effect of, uh, uh, as the calcium? For example, what about zinc or magnesium or other uh, divalent ions? You mean in the effect on biofilm? And, yes. Um, okay. We tested like uh, 13, 14 different elements. Uh, stuff like iron, for instance, also iron makes more biofilm. In the terms of movement, they, we tested less, but the ones that we tested, only calcium work. The other elements don't. Uh, now, in zinc, uh, you know, we studied zinc and now we're studying copper. Uh, we think that, we, we think the element, uh, the, uh, we, the, what we saw was that, that low concentrations you know, it, it uh, inhibits the biofilm, uh, but it has an effect of uh, like the opposite. It's like a stress response of the bacteria, and it makes more biofilm when it is uh, do a threshold. So um, it's different, and with copper, we have very preliminary data, but um, it's very preliminary, but a student of mine is doing like a similar experiment what I showed with calcium, but in tobacco with copper, and she did it, and she sees with copper more a little bit more, we don't know if it's significant, but, or no, doesn't change the symptoms, or it's a little bit more, we don't know yet, but. We don't. There is no uh, direct correlation between the concentration and this negative effect with the copper? We see, when we add copper, we see increase of copper in the sap of the plant, 
So the, the sap is taking more copper, not as much as you put because of the homeostasis of the plant is trying to mm -hmm. not take as much. So the copper increase inside the plant goes up, but the symptoms, uh, instead of going down, it goes a little bit more, but I still cannot tell you <coughs> if we haven't done the analysis yet, but it's the same, or not, but it does, we were expecting reduction, but we don't see reduction of symptoms. Okay, thank you. We have one question. <coughs> Thank you. It's also a question for Leonardo. Sorry for squeezing you. That's good. That's good. Sorry, I talked too fast. I thought nobody could understand me. No, no, it was really, really nice and interesting uh, uh, talk. But I'm, I'm curious about how, to what extent could you explain, for example, the difference between California and Florida because of the different type of soil? Or if you think there are other <coughs> drivers much more important for sure than the soil, but to what extent, because the, the map you show, there are completely different type of soils. Yeah, I don't have like a scientific answer, so because we wanted to do something more with Juan to build more modeling of the soil and, and overlap with the incidence of Salela. Right. So we're not at that moment yet. This was just like a back of the envelope, you know, just like quick and dirty way to look at it. So I don't know if I can make, uh, but yeah, I was looking you know, in Alabama and in Georgia, there's not this soil with high calcium. And we have problems with salella, but it never reached like epidemic uh, proportions like in uh, California or in uh, or Italy. But of course, I cannot, uh, I cannot say it's related to calcium. You know, uh, yeah. I'm just, at this moment, I don't know, and it's gonna be hard to prove that, you know, the, that is really related to the calcium content in the soil. But, uh, there's not like a clear correlation, and I hope when we do more like a mathematical thing, we can establish more if there's a correlation. Right. But at this moment, it's just a back of the envelope, quick and dirty version. Thank you. Thanks. Possibiliano. I have another question for Professor De La Fuente. Just talking about uh, hypothesis. Uh, if we consider that uh, the virulence can be a bad adaptation of Xylella to environment uh, situation, um, do you think that uh, in this uh, calcium uh, dependent uh, behavior, um, the um, plant gen genes can play a role trying to uh, make lower the delivery of uh, calcium to not uh, lead to this uh, increased virulence, if this can be hypothesized? Mm -hmm. Okay, so I think if, if the dumping of calcium can be a way to uh, make it susceptible or more or less. Um, my answer is, I wish it is, so they will prove that, that what we, we're going after is, is uh, uh, more real. Uh, we don't have data on that, so I don't know. Uh, I know that Pasquale were talking like uh, last night a little bit, so I hope he will present some of that data uh, this, during this meeting. Uh, but at uh, this moment, yeah, we don't know. Uh, so there is known like in data from um, uh, grapes and uh, uh, citrus in Brazil. People did like uh, you know gene expression with microarrays stuff like that. So they see, we see a lot of uh, uh, genes related to calcium uh, mo mobility, like the, they are expressed under inspection. Um, but we don't have the comparison with more tolerant or susceptible or yeah. So we cannot tell. You know, yeah. More questions. Uh, okay. I, I want to do some questions, but I uh, do to make. So, so uh, Leonardo. Le Leonardo, yeah. I mean. Again. <laughs> At the end of your abstract, you reported that, that uh, calcium, it, it, this is a sort of uh, nutritional immunity that is described in uh, animal system. So, what's the, the, the how calcium feed the, 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 the xylella? Okay. That's right. Yeah, I took that out of my presentation because of time. So, <laughs> I put it in the after, but then I didn't took it out. Uh, basically, okay, so nutritional immunity is the idea of, you know, was proven first with iron and then with magnesium and zinc that uh, human pathogens, what they, you know, there's a, a tug of war for these elements between the pathogen and the host. So, whoever wins, you know, it's a, and it's a way to control diseases sometimes, you know, that the coast can dump more copper to kill the bacteria, and the bacteria have a way also to, to really, to go to the copper and, and do more infection. Now, in general, the nutritional immunity, as, as we know in human systems or animal systems, is uh, more, uh, you know, control of the disease. But we see it is 
is I put as a nutritional immunity, but it's kind of like the opposite because this makes more disease instead of less. It's not like a depletion of calcium. There's an increase of calcium. So we try to model our thinking about the, you know, the, the, the idea of nutritional immunity, but um, how we call it maybe like reverse nutritional immunity because it's, instead of making less, it makes more disease. Is that your question? Or? On the back, there is some. Okay. Uh, my question is to Ozeas. Uh, I'm thinking about it. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, do you have an idea uh, what the different the the uh, you told us that the F57 and 996 uh, 98 have different amount of the uh, membranes that you measure? Okay. Do you have an idea? The hypothesis, because both strains are closely related, both are bulk strains. So, if I understood, you want to know um, why are the, the two different citrus strains with the different OMVs production? Yes. Um, so, yeah, one of our hypotheses, so th there's one already shown that um, if you have less TSF, you have more uh, OMVs. And we have like previous data that kind of shown that the, um, the FB7 strain also um, produce more DSF than the other strains. It's a preliminary um, aspect, but we have that. So in our model, it's just a preliminary model, um, we um, kind of understand that both higher DSF or, or lower DSF can cause kind of a, a difference of shape of the outer membrane and can be related to the um, secretion of the OMVs. It, it's been something related with that in E. coli also with the, um, the presence of uh, liposaccharide. Um, and then we kind of uh, are assuming that it can have some uh, similar way with the, um, the DSF in and the outer membrane affecting the shape of the yeah, I mean, I, I'm, I'm seeing, uh, because in, at least in greenhouse, the, the, the 9A strain is more virulent than F7. Sorry, I didn't. No, no, at least in, in greenhouse, the 9 the, the both citrus strains, 9A is more virulent than F7. So but we, we haven't, actually, we have no, we have no essay with, uh, so far I know it. But I did, I did. I you I did? <laughs> <laughs> because the preliminary, preliminary uh, um, assays with, we did with tobacco kind of showed that FB7 would be a little bit more virulent than the 9A5C. Uh, but I'm if you're saying the other way around, so let me, uh, we I'm have I'm to talk, wait. I'm talking about the citrus, that the, the 9A is more virulent than FB7. Okay, okay. So okay. we can talk you. later. Okay. <laughs> okay. Milagros. From the, yes. from the previous uh, session, we learned that the uh, diversity of uh, strains from France and from uh, Spain is uh, very high in comparison to the Italian strains. Uh, then a, a question to Annalisa and Mathieu. Uh, do you think that uh, the sequencing of uh, strains from uh, these two countries uh, in which the detection is very recent could provide information uh, about the origin of uh, strains uh, or, or the introduction and other um, possibilities for avoiding uh, new the, the introduction of Silela in other countries? Yes. Yes, I think that uh, the genome sequencing, uh, with genome sequencing, you get uh, a lot of information that uh, without, with the other approach, uh, uh, you are not, uh, there are not available. So I think, yes, this. Yeah, yeah, just, just to add, with, a res with that resolution, you can definitely see very precisely where it comes from, as long as you have the data. So at the moment, we're just starting to sequence a lot of genomes. But, so with times, I think it would be very easy to find out where those eyes that come from. We have a question there. 
Yes, maybe a, a question for Mathieu Van Hove. Um, the way I understand it, what you're doing uh, with uh, um, landscape genomics is, is a bit similar to uh, a GWAS analysis using uh, uh, the climatic data, for example. And when you're doing GWAS, you, you have um, possible bias if your sampling of uh, individuals uh, does not fulfill some criteria. And so I was wondering if you can have some bias in your analysis uh, given the particular structure of the populations that you are uh, using. Yeah, uh, yeah, true. Uh, for GWAS, it would be interesting to also apply here, but you do need way more genome. So population, those models that we presented here, so that I presented the latent factor mix model, it was developed in 2013. Um, so those models take into account population structure. So you can estimate it in various ways and, and sort of account for this, but, but there is also a lot of other bias you, you need to sort of think about, uh, dep depending on the sampling, depending on the population. We still are limited the amount of isolate we're talking about. So, so it's to, to, we need to think about that carefully. And it would be nice to get more data points uh, on, in California, which we will do soon. We have two, two questions, one over there and one over there. Okay. No, thank you. This is a question for Annalisa and Mathieu. I really appreciated your presentations. And Mathieu, we were talking about all your SNPs and the diversity in California and the sort of uh, the periods where it might have been you know, being distributed, etc. <coughs> in the first session, um, the contestants or the presenters, I should say, were asked how long they thought this particular disease was in Europe. They said somewhere between 20, 25 years. I know there's overlap with your teams, etc., with those people who were presenting earlier. I'm just wondering, looking into the data as forensically as you are both doing and with real feeling and hands-on with, with the information, do you support the 20, 25 years or what is the data really telling us? Sorry, I didn't. What's the data telling us in terms of how long the pathogen has been in Europe? Can you, can you, can you give a more, um, uh, do you support the 20, 25 years or has it been longer? I think we need, we need to really take into account uh, to estimate the recombination rate and the evolutionary rate, and that's been done for other pathogens. I think we're going to get there very soon to know for Xylab, but if we just look into what we have now, it is plausible 20, 25 years from what we see. But with more data, we'll know more. But I think it's, it's plausible. Yeah, I think, uh, just, so for the Italian data set specifically, um, we're sequencing a, a new batch of isolates, and uh, so we're gonna have isolates from 13, 14, 15, 16, and 17 on, I think so. Uh, so then you can actually try to calibrate a clock and, and see how that's gonna, what's gonna look like. Um, and my choice is trying different approaches for California because the, the 100 something isolates, they're all pretty much from 16. Yeah. Uh, so then you, then you end up having some problems with that. But I think for the Italian one, there, there will be, yeah, we, we will be able to use a, a estimate a clock based on data. Okay. We have a question over there. Then if other people, I know they have a question on there, on the, and then Maria Agnes, okay, no? So my question is, is, is me now? Yeah, my question is for Alaniza. It's you, Alaniza. Yeah. Here. Okay, Here. Alessandra. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So I wanted to know if you check about the polygalactornase frame shift only in Pauka strain, because I remember that only in Pauka you could see the frame shift in this gene, and um, in Temecula, a strain that causes grape disease, this gene is very important for the pathogenicity. And so probably it's associated with the time of the colonization of the bacteria in the plant. But this gene is in frame shift in Pauka, and we check in the lab that indeed this gene is not functional. And so probably it's associated with the very slow time of the bacteria in citrus at least colonize the host. 
And what's very curious because this frame shift is in the all power constraint. Mm -hmm. And so now, at least at the time that I check it, okay. but now you have a, a whole picture of this genome, and so I wanted to know if it's still so the in, same. So in the download, there is no this frame shift when we are, uh, we, we put uh, also, we have uh, analyzed the, the polygalterase, and we can not see this kind of frame shift. So the uh, coding gene, is, yeah, I have an open reading frame, so. It's, I know, Matt, uh, at that time, the, it was a, a, a draft genome, so now we realize that uh, uh, there is no frame shift, so I, I remember this. Okay. So on the top, uh, if up people there. Uh, my question is for Mathieu. Uh, you didn't find any grouping of uh, isolate according to the different cultivars. Uh, my question is, do the different cultivars have uh, the same response to the different isolates? Or in other words, if you have to make, uh, you have to do a screening for resistance, you have to do it for the different isolate or you can use uh, one single isolate for, for screening? So, sorry, so the question is, do we see different symptoms in different variety? Yeah. For, um, the, for, for the different isolate? Uh, I don't, to be honest, I've only been here for, in this field for like about six months. So yeah, um, I've been focusing on the genetic. I don't really know about the symptoms. But I'm guessing. You want to you try? <laughs> he, he's actually good at what he does. Um, <laughs> so um, the specific question, we don't know what the answer is, but you do have diversity in phenotype um, for the different, uh, isolates. for isolates in different groups. That, so that we've done, and, and, and there are differences. Um, the specific question we haven't addressed it yet, but uh, it's something that actually, there are a couple of people in the audience that we're trying to work with and, 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 and try to address that specific question. Madame Yes, I am Marie Agnès Jacques from France, and I want to comment on the previous questions dealing with the divergence time uh, and the introduction in uh, Europe. So we have made some uh, genomic comparison between the isolates that, that were isolated in Corsica and their relatives from the US, and using root to tip regression with a genomist of population that uh, used these methods to to date the introduction of various human pathogens, we arrived to potential date of divergence between the French isolates and the US relative from 35 to nearly 50 years. So this means that according to this data, we need to expand using more genomes. The introduction in Corsica could have been as old as around the six, uh, 1965 and 1980, depending on the two strains we have in Corsica, ST6 and ST7. So this gives a more ancient introduction than what we have sought up to now. Okay. More questions? I have a question for Matthew. Uh, uh, I know that you, you work focus on vitis, on grapes, but I know that at your lab you are doing a huge effort to sequence many isolates from other uh, hosts. So have you checked uh, where the fastidiosa isolate from almonds in California would fit in that tree or not? Um, but we don't really have any isolate at the moment sequenced from almonds. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, I want more isolate from everywhere, to be honest. <laughs> but, but at the moment, I don't know. Okay. So, if we, if we have no more questions, we have uh, five minutes, and you have to do some... Kind of... What? Okay, uh, 215. Uh, here there is a... Uh, a cell phone. I don't know if one of the speakers left or uh, Sandy. Uh. <laughs> okay, I will check with him. <laughs> okay. Yeah, so we can go to lunch. <laughs>